the question, who feels that the area in which they work, or the area in which they will work when they graduate, is becoming increasingly more competitive? So show of hands for this one. Um, that maybe your wages are not increasing, um, but the expectations upon you are, and that there's more people fighting for less work. Okay, quite a lot of hands there, good. Uh, yeah, I kind of feel that too. And well, it sort of sucks, huh? <laughs> And I thought maybe today we would explore why that might be and what has happened to the good old days of work. Now, I'm aware that you're not really looking for bad news. Um, no one is ever looking for bad news. It's actually exactly why they call it bad news. Uh, and so today there is a little bit of bad news in my talk. And so what I'm going to do is at any moment in which uh, I say something negative, what I'm also going to do is show you a cute picture of a kitten. <laughs> I'm hoping that during those moments you can focus upon the kitten and things will remain positive. <laughs> so, I saw this graffiti recently. For those of you that can't read it, it says, Study, Work, Die. <laughs> I think I got the message uh, from the author of this graffiti, which is that, you know, I, we're all sheeple. You know, and all we do is we just study at the start of our lives and then we get a job and we just do that job, you know, without thinking about it again and again and again until we die. Like, that was... <laughs> the kind of bleak message that they were trying to send. Um, but when I was looking at this graffiti, uh, it seemed to me, for a kind of young person at university, uh, this seemed almost optimistic. This seemed kind of like a best-case scenario. <laughs> <laughs> that actually, you would just study once at the beginning of your life, you know, and become a kind of something, an expert in something, and then you would find work, and then you would just stay in that work all of your life, you know, without having to retrain, uh, and then eventually you would die. Um, <laughs> it's the, the bad news again, no kidding for that. Uh, <laughs> and it seemed to me um, that for that young person, uh, our way through the working world is going to be much more complicated now. It's probably going to be slightly more like this, uh, which we're going to study, and then we're going to graduate, <laughs> and we're going to come out of university, and we're going to look for a job, and it's at that point that we're going to learn that there aren't any. Uh, <laughs> And so maybe we have to take whatever job there is, like an unpaid internship, and we have to move back into our parents' basement. And if we do that unpaid internship really, really well, they'll reward us with a badly paid internship. And if we do the badly paid internship really well, they'll reward us with a badly paid job. Uh, probably not a permanent job, because there's no permanent jobs anymore. It'll be like a temporary job, or a contract job, or a project-by-project project job, or a fixed number of hours job, or some kind of job that makes us work really hard until we have a burnout. And then the cycle will... Um, just repeat, uh, again, and then probably again, uh, and maybe getting tired of working for other people, we'll decide that we should work for ourselves, and so we'll try a startup, because everyone else is trying a startup, so why not us? Uh, maybe we'll build an app, because everyone else is building an app, so you know, why not us? Um, we'll uh, create one of those really useful apps, like a way for people to share their power or something, and. Um, we realise that that doesn't work because there's already like a thousand apps for people to share their parrot. Uh, so there's no money in that anymore. Um, and so we'll go bankrupt. And this cycle re will repeat again five, six, seven, maybe ten times across our working lives. Uh, and then when it's time to retire, we'll learn that the, the pension system has collapsed. And there's actually no money for us to retire because there's not enough young people anymore paying into the pension system for us to take one. Uh, and so then we realise that basically the only option left is to die. Uh, as, per, as per the original instructions, uh, then we'll learn that we actually we can't die because the singularity has arrived uh, and humans have merged with machines and we're now forced to live forever in some kind of matrix hell, uh, doing the only job that still remains, which I think will be uh, kind of optimising social media campaigns for multinational perfume companies. And so what has happened to the world of work? How did it get like this? I think in order to understand that, we have to understand the role that technology is playing in our personal and work lives. Uh, a lot of people, they see technology as something exclusively positive, and I want to make the case today that that's not really true. I believe in something called technological determinism, uh, and this says that we are not shaping technology, it's technology that is shaping us. Uh, every new technology that comes out forces a reaction from us. We have to decide how we're going to incorporate that into our personal or work lives. Now, this is not really new. In fact, humans have had to react to technology uh, since prehistoric man discovered fire. Uh, what is new, however, is the speed with which we're being asked to do that. And this is because of something called the law of accelerating returns. 
which says that disruptive technology is being invented ever more frequently. So while it feels like human progress is linear, actually it's growing exponentially. And this is because every new technology, it gets to use all of our existing technologies, whether it's the shipping container or the airplane or the internet or Google or uh, the App Store or Amazon to propagate itself. Yeah, and so uh, Ray Kurzweil, who coined the term the law of accelerating returns, he says, although it will feel like 100, uh, 100 years of progress in the 21st century, in reality, it will be something like 20,000 years of progress at progress's current speed, and progress is always speeding up. Uh, and so any new invention, or any new app, or any new piece of software, or any new programming language, it can go from something that no one knows how to use, to something that a few people know how to use, to something that you can make really good money if you know how to use, to something everyone is simply expected to know how to use, to something any idiot could do with three clicks of a mouse, to something no one would ever ask you to do anyway, uh, in an ever, ever faster cycle, uh, as technology tries to make the inefficient efficient, um, the complicated simple, and the specialized automated and a commodity. And of course, the problem with this is, uh, a lot of our jobs, a lot of the things that we're studying, is to become an expert, it's to do something complicated. And what we're seeing now is that the kind of time horizons for our skills, they're reducing, they're getting ever smaller and smaller as new technology is coming in and kind of making a commodity of this expertise that, that we've had. And so, for example, a number of my friends are graphic designers, and I've seen how in the past year they're kind of all rebranding themselves now to be a UX designer, uh, which is like someone who specializes a little bit more in, in kind of interface design for apps. And they're doing this because they're seeing that the bottom is kind of dropping out of the graphic design market because there's so many like great templates and graphic libraries and the software used for graphic design is getting kind of simpler and simpler and so the hourly rates are dropping and so there's a need to become ever more specialized to kind of keep at a higher hourly rate. Um, but that doesn't last for long of course because uh, that specialized skill is attractive for new technology again to come in and to commoditize your work. And so the result of this is uh, uncertainty for us in the job market and a need to continually get more specialized. And for our employers, well, they're suffering from the same kind of problem. They can also no longer rely that their business model will survive the internet and digitalization. And it's also harder for them to forecast uh, their needs in advance. And so they begin to employ us in an ever more uh, temporary way. And so we're in kind of a race um, to create new jobs as quickly as technology gets rid of them, or obsoletes them. And sometimes we're winning that race, and there's something like prosperity for the masses, and other times we've kind of fallen behind this curve of automation, and you see the kind of rising inequality, and the kind of hollowing out of the middle class um, that's been happening for the past 10 years or so. And I think that the real problem humanity faces is described kind of beautifully here by E.O. Wilson, and that's that... Uh, our morality tends to move much slower than our technology. And so as he says, the real problem of humanity is that we have paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, but godlike technology. And I think that's kind of the crux of my, of my argument today, is that we kind of have to be humble about this and work together as a kind of global society to minimize the gap between these three things. Um, I hope we're going to get there. Um, but... And we do have some ideas like around basic income and changing our models of, of taxation to kind of keep things fairer and to share the spoils of all of this new technology with everybody, and not just the few people who are creating it. Uh, but in the meantime, you, know, you, are, you and I as individuals are kind of going to be left uh, to be repeatedly kind of swung at by the sharp edges of the free market. And I have some ideas for how we can future-proof future -proof our careers as best as possible. The first one uh, begins with expenditure. So, I call it the freedom figure. Uh, the problem that we're having, I see, is that we've kind of lost control of our incomes. And so, um, uh, our incomes fluctuate from month to month, depending on if we're in work, which type of work we found, or if we're having to take time out to, uh, to retrain or to look for work. And if we've lost control of our incomes, it becomes especially important that we control our expenditure. And so all, of the free, all that the freedom figure asks from you is that you quantify exactly to the nearest euro what it costs to be you. So this is mine. We take my fixed costs. We add to my fixed costs my variable costs. Uh, and you can see that it costs to be me every single month 1,292 euros and 87 cents 
which I guess in Bergen might buy me like a shack in the woods, maybe, <laughs> or like a blanket under a bridge, I don't know. Uh, but in Berlin, where I live, it buys me a pretty nice lifestyle. Uh, and, so, uh, and of course, the lower I make that figure, the more flexible my life becomes, the easier it is to hit. Uh, and of course, my aim is to do that in a way that's you know, meaningful to me, to find meaningful work. Uh, I'm a full-time writer. Um, and that's kind of unusual in 2017, and I'm often contacted by other aspiring authors who ask me how I've managed to do that. And this is, of course, how I've managed to do that. Uh, I, I know that figure, and on average, I hit that figure um, most months, uh, or enough months, that I can keep being a full-time writer. Once you know your figure, once you've optimized your figure, once you've found a way to hit your figure, you can be a full-time anything you like. You can be a full-time, I don't know, astronaut, um, juggler, or a cupcake artisan, or whatever you like. All you have to do is know that figure and find a way to hit that figure. And if I don't earn another cent for the rest of this year, which in my case is depressingly likely, it's still going to cost me that. Okay, what we can do with this model is to try and completely separate our income from our expenditure. And you can actually do that across two different bank accounts. So you can have all of your money coming into one account, and then you just transfer your freedom figure and only your freedom figure into your current account, and it's from this account uh, that you live each month, and at any time in that month you can log in, and you can see how much money is remaining, and you can adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Uh, and the goal here is to stop something called lifestyle creep. This is the phenomenon that when you, uh, when you earn more money, you spend more money. And you may have experienced this, I can see a few nodding heads, you may have experienced this. Um, when you've worked hard, you say, you know, I deserve a reward. <laughs> so I've worked hard this month. And so you do something like outrageously decadent, like I don't know, you spontaneously fly to Las Vegas and drink champagne from a stripper's shoe, or whatever it is. <laughs> I'm not judging you. Uh, but the result, maybe slightly, the result is uh, that the, you break even at best for hard work. Uh, and the problem here is that you're not building up savings um, for the times that you're out of work, and there's going to be a lot of times when you're out of work, and that's completely normal, because now you know, we're going to spend a lot of time looking for work and retraining. And so when we're earning good money, we need to be saving that money uh, to use later. Now the only reoccurring nightmare I have uh, is that I have to stop doing work that I enjoy, writing books, and go back to doing corporate work uh, like I, I used to do. This is a reoccurring nightmare that I don't know, I've become a middle manager at Siemens or something, although actually I probably don't have the skills to be a middle manager at Siemens. <laughs> kind of low level surf at Siemens. Like, I cleans the windows at Siemens. You know, that. <laughs> I don't know if I have the skills for that. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> that I have to give up the work that I love and just do work um, because I need to pay rent this month. And what I like about this model is I know exactly when that day is going to come. And I, I know that because I can calculate my lifestyle burn rate. And I do that by taking the amount of money in my savings account, dividing it by my freedom figure, and then I see exactly how long I have left until I have to go and get a real job again. And knowing that figure and seeing that I have a few months or maybe even a few years saved gives me the confidence to turn down well-paying but boring work. It gives me the confidence to take time out to retrain, or it gives me the confidence to go for like a kind of passion project, something that I think is going to pay off, but it's probably not going to pay off in the short term. Okay, that's expenditure. Uh, let's take a look now at income. It would be great, wouldn't it, if the world was a kind of well-calibrated machine and you could pour in uh, hard work and you could pour in talent, and what would drop out of that machine would be a kind of matching lump of success. It would be great if the world worked that way, huh? but maybe you've noticed that it sort of doesn't, really. And that's why Trump gets to be president, you know, and they're still making Fast and the Furious movies. <laughs> Sometimes the good guys don't win. Uh, and I've tried to understand kind of why that is, uh, and what you can kind of do about it, you know, how you can get ahead in an unjust world. And the answer I find most often is, is this. You're supposed to market yourself, you know, which, if you do it, it's not very fun and feels kind of spammy and seems to involve literally spamming and, and doing kind of business card ping pong and uh, all of this kind of stuff that just kind of makes you want to shower. Um, uh, so there has to be a more strategic way to think about why, why, why and how you can get ahead in an unfair world. And the best explanation uh, I've found for, for people who are able to do that is something called the Lux Surface Area. And this is coined by an American programmer called Jason Roberts. And he says that when people become aware of your expertise, some percentage of them will take action to capture your value, but quite often it will be in a way you've never predicted because the world is too weird and too random for that. And maybe you're not the best judge of what you can offer that world. Uh, and so he says, 
You can't control what opportunities you get. The world is simply too weird and too random and too serendipitous. But you can control the number of opportunities that you get. Uh, and you do that by thinking about uh, not only getting really good at something, but also telling the world about it and the relationship between how often you do versus how often you tell. And so expressed mathematically, your luck surface area is the thing you do well times by the number of people who know about the thing you do well. Um, and this is, for example, why I've come here today to do this talk. Most of the year, I sit alone in a room uh, wanting to kill myself. Sorry, I mean writing. Uh, <laughs> most of the year writing. Uh, and of course, if I want to keep getting uh, paid work, uh, I need to come also out into the world. I can't just focus on getting good at that one thing. I have to come out into the world and tell the world about that skill. Uh, that's part of why I do stuff like this. You know, I have no idea who is in this room today uh, and how I could be of use to you. That is beyond my control. What is within my control uh, is kind of letting you know that I exist. And I do that by coming here and showing you pictures of kittens uh, with the hope that one day we will work together and you will make me extremely rich. <laughs> that is the dream anyway. So in conclusion, um, I think uncertainty is the new certainty. And now whoever gets best at uncertainty wins. Uh, and so I would say uh, all you can really do is focus on what's within your control, which is understanding your freedom figure, optimizing that figure, and trying to enlarge your luck surface area by focusing not only on doing, but also in, about telling. Um, and if you do that, uh, I trust that you will find work and you will still have a promising career. Uh, good luck out there. Uh, I'm sure you're going to be great. Thank you very much. Thank you.